Militarism is the curse over any other curse of the Western world at the moment. We are militarizing ourselves to death and we don't have to. So think constructively. What are we for? I'm happy to be here for a reason. And that is that Yugoslavia, which doesn't exist anymore. I was born in Denmark, lived most of my time in Sweden. And Yugoslavia is a place I was partly educated in, in from 1974 at the Inter-University Center in Dubrovnik. We're at the time when Johan Galtung was a director of that center. And also because Macedonia was a place that suffered tremendously because of Western politics here. For two reasons, the sanctions against Serbia took away the major market for the country. Nobody paid it any compensation for that at the time. And secondly, because 800,000 refugees from NATO's bombing of Kosovo and Serbia ran down here. Also, nobody helped you with that. So I'm very happy to be here and let me rush on to what I am supposed to say. First of all, the word multipolar. I kind of think that a pole is a thing you dig down in the soil and it stands there solidly and unmovably like a Greek temple or something like that. I'm fascinated by Chas Freeman's idea that we call it nodes, N-O-D-E, node instead, or something more flexible, something more interactive, something more dynamic than poles, which sounds like, you know, one, two, three, four, five poles, and that's the world. Um, <clears throat> I think we are more intertwined than that. What we're moving into is a networking world with some nodes. What we are moving out of is unilateralism, or the unipolar world, which has always been for simple-minded people. Whereas multipolar or multinodal world is a little bit more for complex thinkers. So the Americans, of course, prefer unipolar world, but that is too simple for a world that does no longer accept that kind of thinking. And of course, the United States is on its way down. It's just a matter of how fast it will go. And there will be ample opportunities for a better world when the U.S. empire has gone, provided it does not go down by means of nuclear war. That's what we don't know. Third point of departure, let me quote Bernard Shaw, who said, and that applies, I think, unfortunately, perhaps also to scholars, most people look at the world as it is and ask why. And then they do all the analysis of what is wrong in the world. He didn't say that, I said that. What we should do is to look at the world as it could be and ask ourselves, why not? And that is what peace research is about. In distinction from political science or international relations, we are sick and tired of just analyzing what is wrong. Without a vision, there will be no future. Without discussing how to solve problems and what it is we're heading towards, we won't succeed, in my view. And therefore, it's a damn duty of an intellectual to say something about what the future could look like. As the queen of peace research, Elise Boulding, always said, you won't get people to work for something if they cannot imagine it. Imagination is a very important thing. So let me rush on to the first word, democracy. In the West, we can vote, but we cannot select. We can vote for people who some people in parties have put on a list where you can say, I'd vote for this rather than that person. And that is done by maximum one to two percent of the people of the West who are permanent working members of political parties. I'm not talking about those who go and vote every fourth year. I'm talking about those who are active in parties. It's one of the smallest movements in the Western world. That's those who are members of a party. And we have the guts to call China dictatorship with a main party that's not the only one, as you know, which has 90 plus million members, that is 7% of people over 18 in China. And these people are not like those in the West who are members of parties. They are well educated. They have to pass an exam to become a member of a party. 
and they're committed to the development of the country, whereas in the West you can be a member of a party, three different parties in a week, just if you pay, you know, $20 or something like that for an annual subscription to the party. You don't have to do anything. Lots of the Western democracy is now being destroyed by the West itself, because some of the preconditions is free speech, free media, etc., and we all know, those of us who are in this business, that it doesn't exist anymore, or is being circumscribed very, very much. On a different level, democracy has always been lacking behind in the sense that we have no global democracy, but we have a globalized or whatever you'd call it, globally tending economy, investments, trade, etc., and we have a globally thinking finance world and we have a globally thinking military world. But democracy is still limited to each nation state. I can vote for who is in the parliament of Stockholm or Denmark and Copenhagen. I cannot vote for anybody else. That is, of course, meant to be like that because we have actually no direct influence of who is running the international system. So um, what we need is global governance in a democratic way. And we've got to think about ideas and proposals and how to do that because at the moment we don't have it. I'm coming up with some suggestions to it in a little while. Because unless we have a much more democratic global decision-making or global governance, not global government, I don't see how we're going to run this world with all its billions of people and problems and challenges that we are facing in the future. But we're always talking about democracy in a national framework. No matter how much countries have destroyed the UN, we still have the normative power, the soft power, if you will, of the Charter. And there's no reason why we can't have a discussion about how to reform the UN until somebody comes up with something better. I'm very tired of people, also good-hearted people, who say, oh, the United Nations is ridiculous. Look at Srebrenica and look at this and that, and it's marginalized. and..." It's, it's without value. No wonder it is when the world spends three to four hundred times more on arms than on the United Nations, all it does. Is that the priorities we want in the future? Are these the priorities that will create a better world? Of course not. But we need a reform because the UN, as it is today, of course, is slightly outdated. But it is the best foundation for building something better. And by that I mean particularly the preamble and Article 1, which all nations and all countries basically ignore 24-7, that peace shall be established by peaceful means, and that the only right we have to use military is Article 51, the right to self-defense. We are far away from it, and we need to use the normative power of the Charter to peak whole countries and peoples and the priesthood of militarism accountable for the destruction of international law and the norms we already have established. That is time to remind ourselves about that. Okay, we need a reformed security council, we know that. I would suggest that we have an environmental and development council too, not just a security council. And by the way, the security council does not make any security because it covers 80% or more of the world's arms trade, the members sitting there. We need a UN parliamentary assembly of CSOs, that is civil society organizations, non-represented peoples, children and youth, culture and peace organizations, etc., all directly elected by the people, the citizens of the member state. What a bizarre world we have. It's called we the peoples, but who are sitting at the United Nations today? It's we the governments who have appointed ourselves. No, nope, I don't know. I've never voted for the one who represents Sweden in the United Nations. Why can't we have elections about people who represent our countries internationally? There's no, there's no technical reason we shouldn't be able to do that. If we can vote for which is the best song in Europe through SMS, why shouldn't we be able to do international voting for who should represent our, our country our, and us in international organizations. We live with the consequences, but we have no influence on it. Madame von der Leyen in the European Union is appointed at dinner parties. You call that democracy? And of course, we need United Nations media. They have excellent media. They are never quoted anywhere. 
Only Associated Press, Reuters, and all these more or less fake organizations are quoted. We need United Nations embassies in each country. People who can sit and represent what the UN stands for and what has been decided and check whether the national governments and the member states are following up and aligned with what they have voted for and have a dialogue all the time about global governance at the local capitals. And we need, of course, UN or world governance ministers in each member state, as long as we have states. All this will be perfectly possible the day the US empire has fallen. And I predict it will happen within five years. I know it's dangerous to predict things like that, but it will not hold for long. All the things we meet and talk about, Ukraine, Gaza, Lebanon, Iran, Israel, whatever will come up, Cold War against China, my dear friends, it will not last. Second, the word peace in the headline I'm supposed to address. It's actually very simple. Everybody knows what a war is, but if we ask what is peace? Everybody knows what images of war is, smashed houses, dead children. If I ask what is an image of peace, and it's somebody like two young people holding hand while the sun goes down, how damn boring. Peace is much more complex and simple. Complex and simple. Peace is to develop security and secure development for the whole human being and all human beings. Period. There's got to be something that secures that a society develops in terms of socioeconomic development, civilization development. A reason to exist because we think we will also be here tomorrow and will continue working for a better society. And there can be no security or peace if we do not care for that civil society and its development. So therefore, peace is to develop security and secure development for the whole human being, not just materially, but immaterially too, spiritually, and for all human beings. It's exactly like medicine. What does a good doctor do? He or she does diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. Most scholars today do diagnosis. Some predict nuclear war, which I'm totally against saying. It's very destructive psychologically to say there will be nuclear war. And they have absolutely no idea about treatment and healing. It characterizes social science in the West to have no good ideas. But very good analysis of what is wrong. And then we leave it to politicians to make it a better world. Look at where we have ended up. So a good doctor is one who reduces illness, bacteria, cancer cells. And a good peace researcher is one who tries to reduce all kinds of violence. All kinds of violence, not just political or other violence. Now my dear mentor, Johann Galtung, who died recently, said, put peace first and then secure it. Because the security thinking we have at the moment cannot produce peace. Put peace first and then secure it because the present builds on national security, military security, and the utterly stupid counterproductive idea of offensive deterrence. Deterrence means, first of all, I think you're a bad guy and therefore I have to deter you. That's not a way, good way to start a conversation. Do you deter your spouses? Do you deter your children? No, you don't. You trust them. You cooperate with them. You don't start out saying, you're a bad guy, and therefore I have to deter you. And secondly, if you believe in deterrence, the deterrence should be defensive. Offensive deterrence means that I am able to kill you where you live, five or 7,000 kilometers away, and that should deter you from doing what I don't want you to do or deter you to do what I demand that you do. There's no, never ever going to be peace by that way of thinking. And that's why I, two years ago, wrote a rather long story, 150 pages, 30 arguments why NATO must be abolished because it builds on that thinking. There is nothing else 
Intellectually, there's virtually nothing in NATO apart from repetition. But it builds on offensive deterrence. That is, my security is supposed to be built by being able to kill you. And so that's where we are. Put peace first, make peace, learn civil conf conflict resolution, do early warning, have the organizations up, get peace ministries, get peace education going. Remember Gandhi. He was a bit more wise than Mr. Stoltenberg. And then we have defensive defense. That means I only have weapons that I can defend my territory with if you come to me. The symbol of all this, of course, is the Great Wall of China. It doesn't threaten anybody, but it's not that easy to get over. And if you are unhappy with the military, then have a combi defense, which it will be if we do what I said about security and peace, and we do a more democratic world decision-making governance thing, cooperation will become the natural thing, not confrontation, not hatred, not deterrence, not threats, not enemy images, but friend images. It's totally possible, friends. That's how we organize family lives and national lives and organizations with associations of people we uh, have something in common with. And the idea of a common future means cooperation. There is only coexistence or no existence. Militarism is the curse over any other curse of the Western world at the moment. We are militarizing ourselves to death and we don't have to. So think constructively. What are we for? What kind of visions can we have and work together to achieve? Thank you very much. What do you guys think? Do you think we can ever achieve world peace? Please leave your comment below. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for making it this far. If you like this video, you might want to share it with a like-minded friend. Thank you and as always, stay blessed.